Hey, welcome into the Sink of Truth podcast. Uh, Mark Schlereth here in Los Angeles. My partner, Mike Evans, back in studio in Colorado. However you may be listening to us or watching us, uh, subscribe, do all those things, have your kids help you. That's what I do. And uh, I appreciate you guys so much. I'm celebrating my daughter's, get this, Mike, 30th birthday today, 30 years old for the baby Avery. Happy birthday, baby. How does that make you feel? I feel great. I feel you like feel a million old? bucks, man. You don't feel old? Uh, no. I mean, you know, I know that I am old, but I still, I don't know about you. I still, I look in the mirror and still see 23. I'm like, yeah. let's roll. Like I am, uh, <laughs> I'm in the midst. I've been lifting really hard, Mike. I've been going, I've been going really hard. I'm going to try to get back. I like, I'm going to try. I say this, I don't know how committed I am to this, but I'm going to try to get ripped, like not drunk ripped, but like ripped, ripped. Like I'm going to come in here. If I do it, if I do it the right way, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to do this podcast shirtless and it's just going to be traps and titties. That's all it's going to be like just traps and titties. Let's roll. At some point, we're going to have to put the picture of you in high school up on this screen oh. just so people can see how ridiculous you looked as a high schooler. Folks, let me tell you something. It is stupid. Like, mm. how one teenager could have had so much. <laughs> really? I mean, it's yeah. just dumb. Uh, yeah, but you got to, you know, you always understand. what. But now look at him. That's right. Like, uh, I'm like a, uh, I'm like a, White chocolate mudslide, like it's like <laughs> gravity has taken its course, you know. I mean, uh, life isn't what, but I, I'm telling you, I'm committed. I'm getting, I'm gonna get ripped, and uh, then, like I said, I'm gonna do this podcast shirtless, and uh, America is just gonna go crazy. Well, it's all about showing out, and we saw C.J. Stroud's uh, pro day yesterday, and I, I know that I am supposed to take these pro days mark with the proverbial grain of salt Mm -hmm. when these quarterbacks are in that kind of setting and they're slinging around i i can see how people start to get mesmerized start to drool a little bit start to fantasize about what the future can hold because man cj stroud he's got some natural arm talent it doesn't take much for that ball to just come out Yeah, there, there is. How was that again? Woof. Give me, give me that one. Yeah, that, that is the official sound of C.J. Stroud throwing the football. Listen, I, I get that, man. I get you know the shorts and t-shirts and running around and throwing the ball. It, it, one of the things you always have to take with a grain of salt. Like you got to go back to the film and you got to study the film and you got to study him at Ohio State and, and what he did. And I think a lot of the film is really good, man. It made some big time like pro type of throws, big time throws, working through progressions, going from you know going from the right side of the football field, getting all the way through to the left side of the football field. So he's done a lot of those things. Um, but I think when you look at pro days, right, pro days, you have to take with a grain of salt because they're orchestrated. They're orchestrated by the quarterback, by the quarterback coach and by the receiving, you know, the receivers that are there, they, they've all worked on it. So it's not like, Hey, let's just go out in the cold and start throwing the football. Like, let's just go like, this is something that is that it's choreographed. It's like a, you know, it's like dancing with the stars, you know, it's, it's perfectly choreographed. And so um, from a just a pure pressure standpoint and and, and just a, a, the mechanics of it. Like one of the things you do in your pro day is you stay away from things that you don't do well. Right? You you script it to make sure that you're going to look good. Like if you can't look good on your pro day, then you're a turd. Because bottom line is you're not very good. So you should look exceptional on your pro day. And and he did, and I'm not taking anything away from him. One of the things I always get concerned about, Mike, when you know we're evaluating quarterbacks who played at Ohio State or Alabama or you know one of these big time LSU, one of these big time schools, is that you always have the lion's share of the talent. So every time you play against somebody, you're more talented than them. Your third receiver is always going to be way better than that third corner, right? Your running back is going to run circles around their linebacker. So you can create matchups in the college game 
where you have such a decided advantage that it becomes very easy for those guys. So, you know, there's there is the like when you st- when you talk about this critical nature of of football in general, um, you look at kind of how teams are made. You know, a lot of teams or a lot of scouts or a lot of personnel people will look at a guy that comes from a small school and say, hey, the level of competition wasn't as good. Yeah, but neither is your level of talent around you. So, like, there's always kind of that you know, what's valuable, like what what's the most valuable thing? Because when you play at a big-time program like Alabama, do you just line up and out-athlete people? You don't have to out-scheme people. You can just say, hey, man, like I did a, I did a college game. I did one college game back when I worked with ESPN, and it was Florida at Kentucky. And um, they had – I mean, Florida just had unbelievable athletes. And I think – uh, Percy Harvin was one of the athletes of Florida and they would line up and go and, and basically go, you know, three, four wide receivers across the board and, um, they'd run all goes. Right. And so uh, like the, the whole offense was, Hey, if the corners are off, right, just run hitches, right. Run thunder, eight yard hitches. If the corners are pressed, we run goes and we throw it deep. And then all of a sudden we motion Percy Harvin across the f- formation. We enter him into the line of scrimmage and we have him run an option route against a linebacker. So we're running all goes. We're running off coverage. We're getting the defense to go deep. And now we got Percy Harvin just going around a linebacker from Kentucky who doesn't have a chance of covering him. And we're dumping the ball to him and saying, wow, what a genius, you know, Urban Meyer is. Give me a break. Genius, my ass. Like, like, so I always like there's there is it's really I think it's really hard to evaluate guys. So I've seen some mock drafts that have maybe four of the top five picks are going as, as quarterbacks. And right. we, we've we seen a trend over the last decade or so where, yeah, for every Joe Burrow or every one Trevor Lawrence, there's too many Marcus Mariota's, Jameis Winston's, Carson Wentz's, um, uh, Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold's, Josh Rosen's quarterbacks that don't work out. What do you think the biggest mistake is that teams make when it comes to evaluating these quarterbacks that they take high up in the draft? The biggest mistake is ignoring what they don't do well and thinking that your expert tutelage is going to fix them. Because ultimately what has happened, Mike, is because they're because of of the new collective bargaining agreement and because of the, the rookie wage scale, it, it no longer hamstrings your organization for 10 years to draft the wrong guy high in the draft at the quarterback position. So what you've done with the rookie wage scale and the five-year contract and all those things that you've done as a, as a league is you have basically said, now we can be, now we don't have to be as judicious with our pick. Now we really don't have to evaluate. Now we can, you know, we can go ahead and draft a guy and lean on hope and, uh, you know, and like hope is our strategy. And if he doesn't work out, we'll just kick him to the curb. Baker Mayfield, see you around sometime. Carson Wentz, ski around sometime with three or four different teams. Um, hey, Jared Goff, you know what? Yeah, you got to a, to a Super Bowl, but we're not really in love with you. Go to go to uh, Detroit. Yeah, I mean, on and on, Jameis Winston, uh, you, you mentioned Marcus Mariota. Yeah, whoever the case may be, um, Shoot, Sam Darnold is with his third team. Baker Mayfield's now with his fourth team. Um, Josh Rosen's been with seventeen teams, I think. Um, I, like it just, you know, who knows where Lamar is going to go? If he's going to stay in Baltimore, if he'll get a chance to go somewhere else, it, it just it gets to the point where it doesn't hamstring your organization for five or ten years like it used to when you took a Jamarcus Russell or, or like it used to when you had to invest you know, $75 million in Sam Bradford right off the bat. It really hurts you. It, it just doesn't hurt as much anymore. So now what you're, what you're seeing in the NFL draft is you're seeing second and third round talent get drafted in the top 10. And then you just hope that you hit. 
You hope that you get that diamond in the rough. You, you, like hope is your strategy. And it's just an absolute shitty strategy. <laughs> hope is a shit strategy. But that's what NFL teams do. Speaking of Lamar Jackson, so the latest on Lamar is now you're hearing reports that our teams are hearing that Lamar does not have an agent, but that they ha- he has a representative who's not licensed by the NFLPA, a representative who's reaching out to teams saying, hey, 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 Lamar maybe is backing off that fully guaranteed contract. But what's left unsaid is he still is looking for guaranteed money that still goes beyond what anybody else other than Deshaun Watson is making. And also he's passing along the word, this representative of Lamar passing along this word that, Hey, Lamar's ready to leave Baltimore. What do you make of these uh, latest developments? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you're, you're trying to get yourself, you're trying to drum up some interest. I mean, what, what's happened to you is they said, okay, they like the Baltimore Ravens called your bluff. And I, I get that whatever the parameters of the contract and whatever the information that that has been released it's been released by the baltimore ravens so it's always going to make the baltimore ravens look probably better than they actually are right that i mean that's what ends up happening is you end up releasing the parameters of an of a of a contract like hey we offered him three years 133 million dollars guaranteed fully guaranteed it's 44 million plus a year you know it makes him you know right there in 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 the you know right there in the running is one of the higher paid quarterbacks in football and all this stuff and you know i don't know what the i don't know what the monopoly money aspect of that contract is i don't know what the you know the uh the loopholes in that contract are none of us do um but ultimately i think the baltimore ravens you know from a shrewd business standpoint were like what they did was they basically said we're gonna call your bluff like you don't you don't want to sign this deal. You think you're worth more than the market that we think the market thinks you're worth. Um, go test it. Go hey, go get your best deal. And ultimately, what teams are are telling you is, dude, we like we like you, but we don't love you. And we like you, but we don't love you to the point where <laughs> we're going to give up two first rounders. And and, and I've I've told you this. Long ago, Mike, like when you when you put Lamar in like a standard NFL offense, there like there are shortcomings, there are pitfalls. I mean, come put him in a in a in a game against a playoff team where you know he's got to throw his way back into a game. It you know I mean the proof is in the pudding. It hasn't worked out. And so for an NFL team, you say, not only do we have to give up two first rounders and a fully guaranteed contract for this guy, but to put him in a position to where he can really excel and do what he's done in the past. And let's not forget, he's only played 12 games the last two years in a row. But to put him in that in, in that style of offense, we're going to have to change our coaches. We're going to have to change our personnel. Like, do you understand? Do you understand? How many things you would have to do as an organization to make – forget about the two first-rounders and forget about the money. How many changes you'd have to make as a coaching staff and as an offense to create a personnel grouping that actually fits what he does? Like, make no bones about this. And I, I talked to John Harbaugh at length about this. When they decided to make that move, they fully committed to Lamar. From the standpoint of, and I'm not, I'm, he's a rookie, he's, you know, on that deal, so it wasn't fully committed to him from the standpoint of money. I'm talking about fully committed to him from the standpoint of taking a, a professional offense and turning that professional offense in professional football to a collegiate-style offense to the point where Marty Mortingwick started it. They dumped Marty and went to Greg Roman. And, you know, I had, I had this... This just goes all the way back to 2018 when I was doing a game. I think the, the year that it was, was 2018 or was it 2019? It was I think it was the year that Lamar won his MVP, whichever year it was. And doing a Baltimore game in Seattle where John Harbaugh essentially was like, listen, man, we like 
there hasn't been a new passing concept that's been developed in the NFL in 30 years. He goes, we got runs. We've got runs that we have developed that the NFL hasn't seen. They, they, they just haven't seen them. Like these are these are collegiate style. Like this is a completely different offense, and we've got stuff that we haven't we haven't even unleashed yet. We've got runs to last us for the next three years that people have never they've never had to defend. Like that's where we are right now in this offense in the infant stages of creating this offense. And you know, it, but the bottom line is how many how many teams are built that way? There's one team built that way. They're called the Baltimore Ravens because they've made the commitment to build themselves that way. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I just think it's really hard for an NFL team to look at that and go, okay, yeah, let's give up the first two, the, the two first rounders. And, oh, by the way, let's change everything we've done. Like, hey, all this money we've invested in wide receivers, those guys don't really benefit. So, like, it just, you understand that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for an NFL team to go, yeah, that's what we're going to pursue, that guy. Man, it's all about the quarterbacks. Uh, I thought you'd find this one kind of interesting. So Ben Roethlisberger admitted to talking to the 49ers this past year that as the injuries mm-hmm. started to pile up for San Francisco, first Trey Lance, then Jimmy Garoppolo, that he had conversations with the, uh, with the 49ers about possibly coming out of retirement. You already had Phillip Rivers come out and say, hey, he might be interested in a return. What do you uh, make of these rebooting of quarterbacks who all of a sudden have been away from the game for a while and uh, might want back in. Yeah, it just goes to show you, if you're a professional quarterback that can operate an offense, you know, you can operate a drop-back offense, um, even if you're old and even if you're a bit beat up, uh, there's a market for you. And and especially when you can, you can roll into a, a situation like that and say, hey, man, you know, I've done all this for forever. I can still throw the ball, even though I may have lost some of my skill set, but I can get the ball where it needs to go. I understand all the concepts. I understand, you know, I can orchestrate an offense. I can run an offense from the line of scrimmage. I can do all those things. Um, just goes to kind of show you, Mike, um, the value, the value of those guys, especially when you've done it for such a long time that you can roll in there and, and, you say, okay, that concept's like this concept. I get it, and and you know, I can go right into a game and play. Um, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, I think the big surprise for them was that Brock Purdy came in and played so exceptionally well that all of a sudden they didn't need to reach out to you know Ben Roethlisberger anymore. Although it would have certainly been a uh, certainly would have been interesting when Brock Purdy got hurt in that uh, NFC playoff game against the. Philadelphia Eagles, if uh, Ben Roethlisberger would have trotted in from the sideline as opposed to, uh, what, Josh Johnson? Was it Josh Johnson who came in? and Yeah. Yep. yeah you know, the guy that was that, – that dude's been on 47 different teams. <laughs> um, and, and every league every league possible, every league ever created that guy's played in. Well, I would trust that Ben Roethlisberger could probably throw a forward pass uh, down the field – uh, more than uh, Christian McCaffrey could, for example. So I think I would mm-hmm. trust Ben Roethlisberger still at this stage of his life, his career, uh, to be able to do that. Man, as, as we as we bounce around here on the podcast, what did Brandon Cooks do to hurt people? <laughs> Brandon Cooks has been traded again. He's been traded an NFL record four times. This is a guy who was a former number one draft pick in mm-hmm. New Orleans. All he's done wherever he's gone is be productive and teams continue to want him. He gets paid a lot of money. He -hmm. just got uh, traded to Dallas for a fifth and a sixth round pick. Uh, uh, Houston able to move his salary. What's what's the deal with Brandon Cooks? Why why is he so dispensable and how will he fit in Dallas? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. The guy's been productive, right? Former first rounder. He's been productive pretty much everywhere he goes. But ultimately, I think with Brandon Cooks, it comes down to essentially one thing. Um, He has been a guy that's been, let's just say, kind of a one-trick pony. He's a lift the top off of coverage. You know, like, and, and most receivers kind of fall into this, Mike. 
like when you study film, I think one of the things that blows me away about Justin Jefferson, well, it's several things. One, unbelievable with a gritty. The guy can just drop, he can drop a gritty <laughs> at any, taught me the gritty. And it yeah, was, yeah. he taught, oh, yeah. do you ever see me do it? No. Yeah, you, you saw me do the gritty. Can we, can we pull um, that camera back? Can we see you do a little gritty right now? Or is it? No. No, no. I, it, I, it takes me a while to get into the, into the flow of the gritty. <laughs> so, um, but I, that I think that th- painful right there. For you yeah. To just do that. I, yeah. All right. I think, I think the thing about him that that just blows you away when you study him on film is there is not a route in the route tree that that dude doesn't run. Like, it, like there is everything. Like you want to run slants, you run run flats, you run comebacks, you want to run curls, you know, digs, go, go balls. Uh, you want to run sevens, you run run eights, like you know, posts or corners or like whatever, whatever it is you want to run. That dude runs them and just destroys coverage, just kills people. When you start to look at other receivers. There are certain routes those guys run. And it's pretty apparent across the league. Like, so when you study, like when I studied, when I broke down an opponent, uh, there's a couple things I always looked at. I was like, okay, like what does this guy do well? And it's funny, I had this conversation. This is year seven in the league. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, I was picking Gary Zimmerman's brain. All decade team of the '80s, all decade team of the '90s. My teammate in Denver, one of the best left tackles that's ever played the game. And so we're sitting watching film, and I'm always, you know, me, I'm always asking people questions, like like football questions, and just questions in general. Like when I study, you know, to do a game, I'm constantly asking, like, "Hey, man, if you were me, what? How would you approach?" I ask you all the time, "Hey, if you were me, what questions would you ask?" Like what, like what. So I'm sitting with Gary, we're in the, we're in the film room, we're studying film. And I'm like, how are you going to set this dude? And like, how do you go about kind of game planning to set this guy? And he goes, Oh, I'll, I always kind of study what that guy's go-to move is. What does he do best? He goes, cause I always figure when it's nut cutting time, right? When it's third down and 12 and that dude needs a sack, that's the move he's going to throw. And so I'm going to set, in pass pro to take that move away 100% of the time. I'm not giving him that move. And then I'm athletic enough and good enough to adjust to all the counters off of that move. But I'm not going to let that move beat me. So with most wide receivers, Mike, most wide receivers run a combination of two or three routes. So when you prepare to play that guy, you eliminate. If that dude can run like goes and run like the like guy had a, a, a receiver, um, a quarterback talked to me about a certain receiver and said, man, that dude is on rails. Like from an in cutting route standpoint, like I've never seen a dude that can run in cutting routes like this dude can, man, he just turns corn. He like, he is on rails. It's like a, you know, it's like a monorail mono meaning one rail, meaning rail, you know, just, and he can just roll. And, and so you get to the point where you're like, okay, like I, I've talked to defensive coordinators. He goes, it's really hard to cover Tyreek Hill. But that dude runs deep overs and goes that, and, and, and shallows. That's what he runs. And so you all to automatically go in and you eliminate him. He doesn't really run the seven. He doesn't really run, you know, the, the deep digs. He doesn't really run, you know, the, the outbreaking routes. He doesn't really – like he runs – shallow cross or drive and he runs deep cross and he runs ghost U- ultimately mike that that you know what i mean we can sit there and talk all day long about of guys that can and guys that can't but ultimately when you become a one-trick pony somebody looks at you and goes man we need to lift the top of coverage guy so we want that guy but then it gets to the point where you're like well we're trying to expand the offense and he can only really do these things let's move on from that guy so he still has value but maybe, you know, the team that has him for a while goes, yeah, I can get anybody who can run fast. I need, you know, I need somebody who's got a little bit more depth. And 
listen, I'm not trying to bash on Brandon Cooks, but you know that those are the things that you hear when you float around the league and you call games, and um, and ultimately, I think that's one of the things that goes on. All right. Well, his current team is Dallas, and Dallas is shaping up. Dallas is always interesting, but even more so now with this move. And also they get rid of Kellen Moore. Mike McCarthy wants more control of the offense, basically saying, hey, yeah, we were a highly ranked offense, but who cares uh, if we threw the ball all over the place? It wasn't enough to win. And so I want to get back to doing it my way and running the football. Uh, No more Ezekiel Elliott. Dak Prescott expressing some dismay that, hey, he's no longer got his guy in, in Zeke. Where, mm-hmm. where are you at right now with the, the Cowboys and the direction they're going? Yeah, I think that's I think it's really interesting, Mike, because I think it takes great maturity as an offensive play caller to understand that it's not about gaudy numbers. It's about wins. And it really is about giving everybody – in your offense, an opportunity to have success. And I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about success. I'm th- I'm not talking about, hey, I lead the league in receptions or I lead the league in touchdown catches or I lead the league in, you know, touch- in yardage. It's about offensive success, which takes a certain amount of unselfishness. And it's really hard for a young coach because you know how you become a head coach? Put up gaudy numbers. Put up gaudy numbers, even if you're not winning on the offensive side of the ball. Develop a quarterback. You know, put up those gaudy passing numbers, the touchdown numbers, and all that stuff. And and you're going to get an opportunity to be a head coach in the National Football League. And you know, it's a, a guy who's become a buddy of mine. Um, this last year. A guy that I lean on and a guy that, that I, you know, keep in contact with um, is Brian Dable. And Brian Dable um, is a really interesting dude because he's got an offensive coordinator by the name of Mike Kafka, who, you know, went through the went through the proverbial, you know, coaching hire cycle, interview cycle, but ended up ultimately not getting a head coaching job. And when you start to look at, you start to look at um, at the Giants. You start to look at the Giants in general. Um, why? Well, they're not the most dynamic offense. You know, their quarterback. You know, fifteen touchdowns, passing. I think he had seven rushing. Um, you're not putting up gaudy de- offensive numbers, and therefore, you're probably not going to get the recognition that you deserve. But the bottom line is they took a team that I think is of all the playoff teams in the NFL. So 14 teams in the NFL, they by far were the least probably talented offensive football team of those 14 teams that, that went to the playoffs. So ultimately I I look at that situation and I say to myself, that's a guy that understands what they are and understands kind of, where they're going, and and you have to say, man, I've got to let go of my ego, and I've got to call games, and I've got to call a game in such a way that we win, not put up numbers. So is this also an admission from Mike McCarthy that Dak Prescott is not one of those quarterbacks that you can put too much on his shoulders, that he is a quarterback mm-hmm. that maybe we've learned enough about Dak that we need to reel the offense back? that it needs to be more well-rounded. It needs to be balanced. It yeah. needs to be less DAC and more of a collective offense, maybe similar to what the Cowboys watched Philadelphia do with Jalen Hurts. Mm-hmm. Build yeah. a really good support system around your quarterback because we don't think our quarterback's one of those guys that can just go out Mahomes style or Burrow style and just carry an offense by himself. Just remember, there's still only, I believe, one quarterback in NFL history who has a winning record when throwing it over 50 times a game. That's Tom Brady. Peyton Manning didn't do it. Drew Brees didn't do it. Philip Rivers didn't do it. Ben Roethlisberger didn't do it. Like, it's it's Tom Brady. He's one of one. Um, it's hard to win 
it's hard. It's hard to win when you throw it a bunch. You know why? Because bad things happen when you throw it a bunch. You get a tip ball that gets picked. You know, you, you put your offensive line in harm's way. You don't ever let them come off the ball. The bottom line is you don't ever sell the defense. The defense ends up like you're number one. The, the number one thing that you're trying to do as a defense is to make the offense one-dimensional. If we shut down the run, you become one-dimensional. You know what we get to do? Pass rush every time. So when that happens to you, think about it. Think about it just like mathematically. All of a sudden, like in any given football team or any given football game, you legitimately, let's call it, and I'm being very generous, let's call it 15 to 20 legit pass rush opportunities where you, like, you get, like, we know that you're throwing the ball. Like, let's say it's 15 to 20 tops. And I'm, like, I'm, I'm overstating that. But you get 15 to 20 legit pass rush opportunities where you know the defense or the offense has got to throw it. They're, they've become one-dimensional. So that's like your job as a defense, shut down the run to create those opportunities. So you get an offensive coordinator that's enamored with throwing the ball and I want to put up records and I want to have touchdown records and receiving records and quarterback records. So on any given Sunday, you're giving that defense 25 opportunities to rush the passer, 30 opportunities to rush the passer. I'm sorry, but I don't care how good your offensive line is. They're going to break down. Those athletes are better than the athletes you have playing up front. And so you may have some gaudy numbers, but at the end of the day, you're going to lose football games. And you're going to get guys hit, and you're going to give up sacks, and you're going to give up defensive touchdowns. You're going to give up those things um, because that's that's the way the football works. And the the problem is 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 selfishness, very much like receivers, you know, that, that become divas. Offensive coordinators want to put up offensive numbers, and sometimes you've got to you've got to take a step back and go, "Hey, man, we're winning this game ugly." That's why veteran coaches that don't have anything to prove anymore, that aren't trying to, you know, that like guys that have come to the realization is, hey, man, I'm a really good coordinator, and that's what I like to do. Or I'm a really good O-line coach, and that's what I like to do. I'm not trying to climb. I'm good with where I'm at. And Mike McCarthy is basically saying, I don't need a climber. Like, hey, man, we've proven that we can be a playoff team. We've proven that we can put up some offensive numbers. We've proven – you know, we've proven we also proven we, we can't win in the playoffs consistently. We've also proven we can't compete for a world championship. And so Mike McCarthy is saying, man, I don't I don't care about the the sizzle. Like, you know, when you go to a when you go to a, a, a fine steakhouse, Mike, I don't order a plate of sizzle. Right? I order the steak. I want to eat a freaking steak. Not I, I don't care about that. And Mike McCarthy is telling you, man. I don't care about the sizzle anymore, man. I want the steak. And you know what else he's telling you? He's telling you going into a year in which I, I probably am coaching for my job. Sure. That's the case, I want the responsibility. Right. I want this to be my offense because if I'm going down, I want to go down running my kind of offense. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the other part of it as well. So it should be fascinating to see. Cowboys, never boring. They are never boring. They're they're always the con they're, they're always content, man. Cowboys content. It's just the way it works. It's kind of like us. Stick it truth podcast. Hey, man. Thanks for watching. We appreciate you guys. Make sure you subscribe. Um, make sure. Are we done? We we done? Let's, or did you have something else to tell me? No, we're good. We're good. We're okay, good. Good. Okay. You know, we're apart from each other, and you know, we didn't, like we can't give those. Uh, you know, those. Uh, the look. Those. The little cues, you know, the look and the, and the, like, hey, I'm done. Yeah. Like, it doesn't work there. But anyhow, hey, make sure you subscribe. We thank you so much. Yeah, wind it up. Wind it up, Buster. <laughs> uh, subscribe. Uh, share it with your friends and your family. We appreciate you guys so much. We'll be back with you next week for all of us involved in the Stink Truth Podcast. For Mike, I'm Mark. For Sean, who's helping us out, producing the whole thing. Uh, we appreciate you.